Good evening. Pam, please. Oh, the yeah. time is 5.32 p.m. and the Board of Trustees are in regular session. Okay, would you please note that uh, Ms. Robles is in attendance. Judge Alex Solis isn't, the title keeps getting longer, is in attendance. Mr. Uxer is on his way up. And myself, we have quorum. Mr. Snow, would you mind leading us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Again, welcome to our March uh, board meeting. Approval of Pam, uh, item 1.4, approval of minutes, January 25th, 2018, February 27th. Is there a move to approve? Second. Second. Any questions? Okay. Pam, we're ready. Mrs. Robles. Aye. Mr. Uxer. Aye. Ms. Solis. Aye. Mr. Fierro. Mr. Fierro. Aye. <laughs> okay, under open forum, we have um, Virginia, because if I attempted to say your last name, I will butcher it. Please, welcome. It, it, Thank you. And I apologize. <laughs> Good evening and welcome. Good, good evening, Dr. Savata, members of the board, vice presidents and guests. Uh, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to bring um, an issue to the board that I think is very important. Um, if our technician can load the PowerPoint that I have, you should be able to see on your screen um, my uh, presentation regarding uh, the um, Arroyo at Mission del Paso. Um, there you go, thank you. All right. Does this thing work? Okay, awesome. Thank you. So as you can see in this uh, aerial um, satellite picture, this was where the campus was gonna be, uh, but this picture is taken back in 1991. As you can see, there is no significant arroyo yet. And this is in 2002, uh, once the construction was done of the first uh, buildings and parking lots, and you can see the arroyo um, much better to the bottom of your screen, if I can show right over here. Um, by 2005, the arroyo is moving upstream and becoming wider. And by 2010, it has reached all the way to um, I-10. In 2015, you can also see there are now side channels that are feeding into the arroyo, thereby making it wider and deeper. And as of January, which is the most recent picture I was able to get, you can see how much wider it is all the way through um, and now the agricultural field that used to be here is now buried under sand, sediment, and trash. Even though there, are no dump there is one no dumping sign, the college has used construction material 
to try to prevent further erosion which threatens our parking lots. Um, unfortunately, some of the material that has been dumped is made of asphalt, plastic, rubber, which can leach into the ground, which is our aquifer, the, the wakeable sun, which is where we drink from, which is where plant and animals drink from. So even if you have a filter on your house in your faucet, you might still be eating plants or crops or cattle that are watered with the polluted water that um, can, can, you can have from this. This is the corner of the easternmost parking lot at the campus, and you can see the Arroyo is literally inches away um, from, from the parking lot, despite uh, the best effort. This is about 30 feet away from the Arroyo. This is a crack, a fracture in the parking lot, which runs the length of the parking lot parallel to the Arroyo. Again, despite all the countermeasures that have been put in place. This was a view towards the end of the Arroyo and the agricultural fields beyond that I took three months ago. And you can still see the cliff-like side of the Arroyo on both sides. This was taken just yesterday, and you can see that side of the cliff has almost completely eroded. Another issue, um, which is also a concern for the text, uh, um, Texas DOT, is that when the water comes through the culvert under I-10, this is I-10 right there, it washes away all the DOT countermeasure, and you can see pipes that are exposed, and it even scours and removes the dirt under the culvert, which could possibly lead to a collapse eventually. But after I made a few calls to people that I know at TexDOT, this is what happened yesterday, uh, or the past few days, they brought in loads and loads of sand and dirt to fill in. Again, this is putting a Band-Aid on the problem that we have, and I certainly believe that something needs to be done, not only by TexDOT, because they only have the right of way, but by the college to prevent further erosion. We need a permanent solution. We need to remove this construction debris, which is not good and not friendly to um, the environment, and find a permanent solution, a retention wall or something, especially in view of the new buildings which are fixing to break down ground and send more water towards the Arroyo. I also have a, a poster presentation. If any of the guests would like to see it, um, you can, if you go to the second presentation, uh, the board member and vice presidents can see that um, on their screen. Um, and it gives you a little more information also. Um, again, this is really something that is close to my heart as a geology major. Um, I understand how all this work. Um, I don't know if maybe we need to revisit plans, talk to engineers, and have them talk to geologists. I don't know if any of you have questions, but I would be glad to answer them. No, no, thank you very much. Are you gonna leave these, this flash drive with us so that um, Pam can make copies and share with the, the administrators and the rest of the board? Um, I'm sure you, you can, you know. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, who owns title to the land uh, that, that the Roy is on? My Do understanding, you know? according to what Mr. Rick Torres told me when I brought this issue to him, he told me we don't own the other side of the Arroyo, but I 
believe we do on this side uh, where the campus is on. So we probably own half. We own half of it. <laughs> something to the middle, something like that. Huh? Exactly. We might. We maybe we can do anything about the other side, but we might be able to put a more permanent wow. uh, countermeasure on our side to prevent uh, uh, the parking lot or maybe even the buildings from falling into the arroyo eventually as it grows bigger and bigger. Did you do is this as a project for your class? I, it started as a project for my class, That's yes, good. sir, as we were trying to determine uh, <laughs> what, was, what the layers uh, were um, constituted of, and we discovered that it was mostly made of sand, silt, and clay, uh, and basically it has no, it's not structurally sound, you know. Water can easily just erode it every time it, a storm f flows through it. It just carries away um, tons and tons of sand, uh, undercutting the banks of the arroyo, which leaves a mass of that sand and silt and clay overhang with no support and eventually gravity takes it down, which is how the, the arroyo has gotten wider and deeper with every storm. Well, well <clears throat> as a petroleum, a registered petroleum engineer. Yes, sir. Okay, well, my focus was geology, and let me tell you, this is an outstanding presentation. I think uh, not only have you documented it well, but I think your conclusions are valid and they're very important. And so I want to compliment you on this, and uh, I think you deserve an A for your project. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you again. You wouldn't thank mind you. leaving the flash drive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pam, item 1.7. Oh, would you please note that Dr. Graham is here? Item 1.7, presentations by individuals, groups, and organizations. Item 1.7.1. Dr. William Sarata, college president, will present a certificate of completion from the Association for Instructional Research Data and Decisions Academy to Mr. Salvador Moreno. Mr. Moreno, can you join me at the podium? Hey, Mr. Moran, there you are. So, Chair, Chair Fierro, members of the board, um, every year we've had the opportunity for the last couple of years, uh, two to three years now, how are you doing, Mr. Moran? Good to see you. Um, to a sponsor, um, through Achieving the Dream, one of our staff members in institutional research uh, and analytical services, uh, to attend Data, D Data and Decisions Academy um, that's put on through the Association for Institutional Researchers, known as AIR in the field. Um, so this year, Mr. Moreno not only went, uh, but com successfully completed um, all of the courses that were required and has received uh, the AIR Data and Decisions Academy Certificate of Completion. Uh, it actually occurred uh, in the late fall, and so we wanted to recognize him. Uh, he's hereby recognized for successful completion of foundational statistics for decision support overview of survey design. And we certainly, it's signed by uh, Dr. Christine Keller, the executive director for AIR. Uh, very proud of our staff and all of the work that they do. And Mr. Moreno, congratulations and, and well done. Item 1.7.2, Dr. Dolores Gross, Executive Director, Resource Development and the Foundation for EPCC, Foundation Chairman Bob Snow and Vice Chair Patricia Marquez will present <coughs> foundation updates and recognize recent funding partners. Lucy Michael, EPCC faculty in honor of Dr. Emel Michael, a GECU, Pride Industries and Northeast Rotary Club. Welcome Dr. Gross. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Chairman Fierro, Board of Trustees, um, faculty, staff, and guests. 
and the Foundation for El Paso Community College is pleased to be here with you this evening to present to you a few brief updates and to recognize some of the Foundation's donor partners which have helped the Foundation support student scholarships and degree completion. So this evening we'd like to share with you a few highlights and I'd like to uh, call up and recognize the Foundation Board Chair, Mr. Bob Snow, and then our Vice Chair, Patricia Marcus. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Gross. I really appreciate uh, being here. First, before I began, we have been before you a number of times. I cannot thank you enough and tell you what a great job the Foundation staff Dr. Gross and her entire staff, what the, the amount of work they do that makes our job on the board so much easier. They have expanded the reach of the foundation over this last year, and Dr. Gross and the entire staff, I just want to thank you all. Um, bringing you up. <laughs> bringing you up to date on a couple of the facts, we were just, there's a lot of things going on. Our main job is to raise money. That's plain and simple for scholarships for EPCC. And what we're excited about in looking back from the fall of 2014 till the summer of 17, uh, we generated about a little over 1,000 uh, degrees and certificates. Uh, we had a 44% graduation rate. And we understand that the students who come to EPCC, so many of them are working. It takes a little longer, but we are moving forward and we're pleased with the, the progress that we're making. The cumulative GPA of 3.0, I remember being here about six months ago when I think it was the track team was here and they had a 4.0. I need more of them on this list. <laughs> but um, the, uh, the next slide uh, under the scholarships, we're really excited. This is how we measure what we are doing. Uh, since the academic year of 2009, more than two and a half million dollars has been awarded to over 1,500 plus scholarships. 73% of those are students uh, who are uh, with financial need. So uh, we're doing the job of getting money to the people that, that need it. But that's another area where I think your staff is doing a really good job, getting out, talking to the schools, promoting uh, what we're doing, what the college is doing, uh, it's really key. Um, we made some changes this year so that our audit will mirror the college's audit. So the completion of the 2017 audit, we were on an annual basis, we're now mirror the, the uh, college. We had our second annual Fajitas and Margaritas fundraiser. Now our job is we go out and we simply promote the college and we ask corporations and individuals for money. We felt it was important that we start to get a, uh, an event and we're very pleased. Uh, the event is, for me, it's, it's two things. We need to raise money and we're able to match these funds against STARS Foundation. So we're growing and people are having a great time. But then what I'm really excited about is we highlighted different areas of the college. And, and there's a lot of great um, schools. Uh, there's a lot of good programs here. Uh, but one that I've been excited about highlighting and they've been great partner with us is the culinary. And so what more fun is to divide the culinary school into teams and have them uh, cook margaritas and fajitas. I mean, how tough is that to bring people in? And we're very careful, not too many margaritas, a lot of, <laughs> lot of, uh, a lot of uh, fajitas, but we really have fun. And I went with uh, one of the chefs to two or three um, TV stations to promote it. And it was just fun to watch him uh, talk about his work. He's so proud of, of the work you do here. Um, the next slide. I'm not gonna go into detail. Uh, Patricia and Dr. Gross are gonna go over this of the great partners we have to present to you today. But uh, just the number, uh, raising 160,000 uh, from September till September till now. That's terrific. Oh, and by the way, before I leave two, uh, one thing I want you all to note, the next margarita and fajita event is September the 13th. 
Uh, so we are already working on the foundation board on our fundraiser. Uh, we're already going out to talk to people about it, so I want you to put it on your calendar. And with that, I'll turn it over to my good friend, Patricia Marcus. So just a couple of activities that the foundation has worked on this year. Um, the foundation, that would be Dolores and her wonderful team, uh, has hosted over 20 campus scholarship workshops uh, through March of this year, and more than 300 students participated. Uh, we need more and more and more students to participate in these as we want to give as many scholarships as we can. Um, the foundation also partners with STARS uh, Scholarship Fund. We were able to provide 40,000, they match 40,000, so that's $80,000 for student scholarships for the 2018-19 year. So, Dolores, we think you want to go individually by Yes, contributors. Thanks, Patricia. I, I'd like to mention some of the foundation's funding partners that support students at El Paso Community College. Uh, this is our second year with Hospitals of Providence, uh, a $35,000 installment of their $175,000 commitment to EPCC students. Uh, our partner, Wells Fargo, and uh, Wells Fargo this year funded $20,000 for student scholarships. And these are students coming out of the high schools, the dual credit programs, or those early college high school students who have not yet completed their associate's degrees here at EPCC. Uh, we worked with all the school districts, uh, contacted all the counselors, all the administrators at each of the districts, dual credit faculty, did a mail out to 500 individuals, um, did live workshops at some of the early college high schools, as many as we could get to, to get students applying for this available funding to finish their associate's degrees here at the college. Um, another one of our uh, funding partners, El Paso Electric Company, uh, funded $10,000 in unrestricted funds for student scholarships. Um, they set no criteria, so students were able to apply for this, and hopefully they're applying as we speak. Uh, the deadline is April 1st. And now we would like to recognize uh, some of the donors who deserve much appreciation and are really building the future of El Paso Community College. Uh, one of them is one of our own faculty um, that you all know well, Lucy Michael, um, almost Dr. Lucy Michael who set up an endowment in honor of her beloved husband, Dr. Emil J. Michael. Uh, we're very proud to have this endowment fund at the foundation in honor of Dr. Michael. Um, those two were quite an incredible team, uh, Lucy in mathematics and Dr. Michael in the sciences. Um, that little picture is a tribute to him and his stargazing. Uh, many of us remember his astro notes that he would send out every Friday, teaching us all about the stars and the constellations and what to look for in the sky. Um, and we know um, that he would be very proud of Lucy and his son and their effort in building this endowment in his honor. Thank you so much, Lucy. Next, we'd like to recognize a one, another wonderful EPCC partner, our friends at GECU. Uh, GECU, as you know, has a beautiful branch at the Valle Verde campus, and uh, they employ EPCC students at that branch. Uh, they also are working on engaging our architecture students currently in helping to design future GECU branches. So that is a, a conversation that began this week with our architecture program and GECU. And we'd like to acknowledge and recognize GECU and thank them for this $10,000 contribution for student scholarships. And here, 
We have Jackie Valdez, Ruby Alvarez, Carmen Guerrero, and Stephanie Queros. Thank you all very much. Our next funding partner, we're so proud to have them with the Foundation for EPCC. Uh, Rotarians, as you know, and, and in a little bit, we're going to uh, recognize uh, Mrs. Laurel Roberts, and, and Ernie Roberts, by the way, was a, a Rotarian. Um, Northeast Rotary has been a consistent partner with the Foundation for EPCC for years, and they have supported students with $5,000 for scholarships, and we wanted to publicly thank them for their continuous and ongoing support for students in Northeast El Paso. And we have Leonard Olson and Jimmy Melver. Pride Industries is special to our hearts. Pride supports students with disabilities. Uh, these are important scholarships. We're proud to have them with the Foundation for EPCC. Pride is on Fort Bliss. They're here in El Paso and they're supporting students with disabilities. And this is their second year with the Foundation for EPCC. And we're so proud to have them as a funding partner. And here from Pride, we have Jeff Bellis, who, by the way, has also been faculty at El Paso Community College. He was telling me that he taught algebra at the Mission del Paso campus. So welcome, Jeff, and thank you. Thank you all for your time this evening. I want to leave you with this thought. Um, there's a tree that you may have noticed. It's been there for some time out in the foyer here of this ASCA building. Um, that's an endowment tree. And we are going to be putting a leaf on there in honor of Dr. Emil J. Michael. And uh, there will be others, but uh, that's because a tree is a living thing and an endowment is a living and lasting gift that will contribute to the futures of students um, in perpetuity. And so we are very proud to put Dr. Michael's name on that tree. Thank you so much. Mr. Snow, Ms. Marcus, thank you so much for your leadership. Dr. Gross, thank you so much for all you do. Great presentation. Thank you. Item 1.7.3, Ms. Aliana Apodaca and Ms. Laurel Roberts will present $14,000 from the Gifford Foundation and private contributions to the Dr. Ernst Roberts Endowment Fund in honor of Dr. Roberts' memory and dedication to the college in his over 40-year career at EPCC. Hello, everyone, again. Uh, we had a special birthday this week, and it was in honor of Dr. Ernst Roberts, 40-year staff member here at El Paso Community College who started as a faculty member at Logan Heights in what Laurel Roberts described as uh, basically the size of a broom closet uh, with four desks in it. And uh, he served in many roles at the college um, to include interim president. Um, he developed uh, many programs at the college, including the Leadership Academy. And uh, this fund, it, we are here this evening 
to recognize Eliana Padaka of the Gifford Foundation and Mrs. Laurel Roberts. Um, each of those individuals, the Gifford Foundation and Mrs. Roberts, are funding $7,000 each for a total of $14,000 to bring Dr. Roberts' fund to $25,000 so that it will also live in perpetuity in Dr. Roberts' honor. So we want to thank and recognize Aliana Apadaka and a special thank you to Mrs. Laurel Roberts for keeping Ernie's memory with us and alive always. Thank you. We're just so happy that we can finally give you this last check. Uh, there's been many, many people besides ourselves that have given to this uh, endowment fund, so we're just excited that we can now put this with the foundation and put this to work in Ernie's memory. We had a great time at his birthday party on Monday. The culinary school did a wonderful job, um, and Laurel was very wonderful in sharing all her memories with about Ernie. What do you want to say tonight? No, I just wanted to thank everybody who contributed and made this happen. Um, I know how important this school was to my husband. It was everything. And he literally did start at Logan Heights. And his office was so tiny that you had to stick your hand in the drawer using the Braille method <laughs> to find what was in there because there wasn't enough room to open the drawer. And uh, I don't know if you all know this, but Ernie's dad was uh, the assistant commandant at Fort Bliss. And when the college needed land, he was the person who signed the document that allowed them to use Fort Bliss campus and use the Fort Bliss, the Logan Heights area, for um, the, to the, be the start of our community college. So it was kind of a full circle. I know that he was putting a lot of time and effort into the uh, Fort Bliss campus, our, our branch there, and I'm hoping that's still going to go through because that's one of the reasons he stayed at work up until the last day. He literally worked up to his uh, last trip to MD Anderson. So I wanted to thank especially Dolores and her awesome staff. I can't tell you, um, looking at my husband's pictures has been very difficult. It's been three years now. And uh, I just handed him that big black bag and they said, here, <laughs> use these pictures and see what you can do with it. And Perla especially, I want to thank you and she didn't want to just put a slideshow together. She wanted to add text to it as well. So it was very, very nice. So thank you all. I know many of you contributed to this fund. A lot of you did payroll deduction. I'm not sure who all those people are. So I'm, uh, this is a personal thank you from me. And I especially want to thank Aliana and her beautiful husband, Stafford, because um, it was her idea to have Ernie's birthday party. And originally we were going to try to do like the, the uh, fajitas and margarita kind of thing. But um, we were able to pull it off, just the two of us, to finish off the 25000 fund. So thank you all very much. You know, Sir Robert, you're being very, very modest. Uh, if you ask any of the board members, Dr. Sarata, uh, Dr. Uh, Rote, I couldn't remember his name, um, <laughs> Dr. Rote, he, they will tell you that Fort Bliss would never have gotten to the point it is today without Dr. Roberts. Okay, great. And so, that, yeah, by all means, it you're being way too modest. It meant to him because you see it's a full circle. Yes. And if it hadn't been for Fort Bliss, we wouldn't have a community college here because you didn't have any place to go. And um, I, 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 I don't know how many people know that, but I still remember <laughs> yeah. the broom closet that was his office. Now, Dr. Sarata asked that these checks be made in his name, so, <laughs> so I give them to you now. <laughs> give them to Dr. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> so who gets the checks now? Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you again. Item 1.7.4, the Student Success Core Teams Equity Group will present the EPCC Equity Statement 
and is seeking approval from the Board of Trustees to adopt the equity statement. Good evening, Chairman Fierro, Board of Trustees, Dr. Serrata, guests, community members, and colleagues. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you this evening. I'm Lucia Rodriguez. Uh, I am the co-chair of the Equity Committee, and other members are present here. In the Equity Committee, we have representation from the Student Success Core Team, from cabinet member, dean, faculty from across the district, from the Center for Students with Disability, from diversity programs, career services, Office of Student Success, marketing, and we have a Student Government Association student representative also that will present with me, Brian Mena. Uh, so 50 years ago, about 50 years ago at the height of the Civil Rights Movement, the people of El Paso activists took action to create a college of the community. They felt that they were, they were convinced that, El, that if El Pasoans had equal access to higher education, they could take care of their families. It would be good for families and for the community, and they were right. So 50 years later, here we are, and it's so exciting that on the 50th anniversary of our college, we are talking about the topic of equity to take us into the next 50 years. Equity is a national movement in community colleges. As you know, El Paso Community College is in achieving the dream college. And uh, achieving the dream has a tool called the Institutional Capacity Assessment Tool, which assesses our strengths and shortcomings in several different areas. And um, several hundred employees of the college took the ICAT and found that equity and the use of data were two areas that we needed help with. So um, being that equity is a national movement, we're so excited that we're part of that. And equity is envisioning what kind of college we want to be. It's looking at policies, practices, and behaviors through an equity lens. So equity does not mean treating all students the same. It means giving students the, the help that they need in order to succeed. Equity requires that we ask ourselves, are we at EPCC unintentionally creating barriers for particular groups of students, especially underserved students? Is each student receiving what they need to be successful? Are policies or practices required for students or are they recommended? And as we know, students don't do optional. So we're, we're looking at practices. Are they required or are they recommended? Is there an intentional design for our college experience? So equity is a shift in how we think. It is evolving from only asking our students college ready to asking ourselves, are we student ready? Is our college student ready? So the equity group charge is um, to create opportunities for deeper conversations about equity and engaging the entire college to reflect, to take the time to assess and take action steps to remove barriers and develop action plans that lead to success for all students. Along the way, we hope to contribute to reaching the 60 by 30 Texas strategic plan to increase educational attainment in Texas and in El Paso. So the equity project will involve everyone at the college. Uh, so it's a big, huge project, and the way that we have taken it on as a committee is that we have three uh, different approaches to um, looking at equity, and one is, the first one is leadership and vision. So leadership and vision, what we set out to do is to form a common understanding, a definition of equity, which I think you all have there in front of you, our equity statement. The second one is engagement and communication. Once you approve our statement, we hope to engage everybody at the college. We are going to, we've been as successful in having equity as the theme for our fall 2018 um, faculty development week. And the third part of equity that we are going to do is we are going to look at all our policies, procedures, and practices. And we are going to ask, does the college consider equity when proposing and evaluating all policies and practices? 
So we are here today to seek your approval of our equity statement. Thank you very much. And uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you for all the work, Mr. Rodriguez, you and your committee have done. Um, you, it's really a detailed uh, statement that you've written. Um, I'm going to ask that um, the board table this until the April board meeting. Um, there's nobody who supports equity more than the, uh, the board that we have right now, which I wholly believe. Uh, but there is uh, uh, some input that, that wanted to be uh, in, interjected into the, the our thoughts um, by, by um, a couple board members. So I'm going to ask that we table this and put it back on the agenda for next month. Um, I'd like to give uh, our student government association sure. rep an opportunity to also share how students will also be looking at equity and how they've already started to address equity inequities. Please. Good afternoon, esteemed members of the board, Dr. William Sarata and presidential cabinet and guests. See, that so, microphone was made for me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you lift it up. So my name is Brian Mena. I'm currently the vice president of student government and I'm also serving on the equity committee. So in a world where everything has a price tag, sometimes the financial burden of being a student can be a little too much, especially for certain students. So the Student and Government Association of El Paso Community College has addressed inequities for students of lower socioeconomic statuses by opening, by opening the town of food pantry, starting the emergency book loan program, uh, and also by drafting a resolution to support the open educational resources. And so as a body that advocates for students' needs, it is our duty to put equity at the forefront of every conversation and everything we do. And so we strongly urge the Board of Trustees to consider equity, to consider, to consider adopting the equity statement to start this conversation and to really begin you know, this, this journey of addressing inequities and being more equitable. And so thank you so much for your time. No, thank you. Uh, Dr. Sorata, um, can I ask you please if, if we could set a, a, a timeline to where the Board, if they have any questions uh, or concerns or input on this statement be given to you so that we can get it to Mr. Rodriguez and the committee in time uh, for them to consider the, any change or it, consider them uh, by our next board meeting? Yes, sir. Dr. Graham, you had a, qu a question? No, I didn't. I, I had um, just asked about um, the Native Americans. I think oh. that that's another population that's not reflected on this. Okay, and, and, we'll, and we can add that into um, our, our suggestions. Um, and again, get them to you with plenty of time for you to, in the committee, to digest them and consider them um, for us to put, uh, consider it on the April board meeting. And thank you so much for all your work and your vision and your passion. Thank you. Item 1.7.5, optional presentations will be made by the presidents of the Classified Staff Association, the Professional Staff Association, the Faculty Association, and the Student Government Association. Good evening. Good evening. Tonight, the Faculty Association would like to address the topic of being ready in case of an active shooter. And prior to me saying anything else, I would like to go ahead and say that we are very proud of our EPCC Police Department. We believe that they are outstanding. They have worked very hard to create trainings that they went out of their way to make available to faculty as well as our students. They also, in the training that I was involved in, were very intentional about making sure they invested themselves in answering everyone's questions. This is a not in any way about our police. But we do want to talk to you about a system. And to use myself as an example, I completed this training two years ago. At the time I completed it, for me it was optional to go through the training. In the two years since, I've never gone through any refresher, and there's never been any drill or practice to see if I would be able to apply the skills that the police department shared with me. I do not think that I'm the only faculty member for whom this is true. And so on behalf of the faculty, we would like to request that we study the system to make sure that it does what we think it would do that we check to make sure that every student and every employee has gone through the training, that periodically we insist that that training is renewed, and that we test every so often and drill to make sure that everyone would do what we have trained them to do. Tonight, I've also invited Dr. Josh Heverett. Dr. Heverett is a member of our faculty at the Cotton Valley Early College High School in the history discipline. He is also a Columbine survivor. 
and I asked him to share his perspective with you tonight. Good evening, and um, thank you for allowing me to say a few words about my experience. But before I begin, let me thank all of you for all that you do for our students, for our faculty, and for our staff. It is a privilege to work at an early college high school that is attached to this amazing institution. I was a senior at Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado on April 20th, 1999, when two of my classmates entered our school with sawed-off shotguns and semi-automatic rifles. They murdered 12 of my fellow students and one of my teachers, a wonderful man named Dave Sanders, who was my business law teacher that, in that last semester. I am here tonight to stress the importance of school safety and crisis readiness. Back in 1999, I served on the Jefferson County Public Schools, Columbine High School's home district, Youth Advisory Council. We met on a monthly basis to discuss relevant issues with the district superintendent. And on April 5th, 1999, 15 days before our tragedy occurred, we met to discuss school shootings and readiness. I laughed. I said, and I will never forget these words, this will never happen at Columbine High School, ever. It is impossible. 15 days later, I was proven wrong. We had no idea what to do. The police had no idea what to do. The SWAT team had no idea what to do. People died because nobody knew what to do. Dave Sanders bled out in front of his students because nobody knew what to do. And I sat in my parents' living room watching the news roll in about my friends who died, knowing that just 15 days earlier, I thought that this was all a joke and that it was impossible for it to happen to us. I urged this board and our members of our excellent law enforcement team at EPCC to continue to do something. Do not make my same mistake. Please take this seriously. We need a plan. We owe it to our current and our future students to be ready if this happens to us. And it might. I don't want to seem hysterical. I do not want to sound overdramatic. But it might happen to us. And we cannot be caught flat-footed. Especially since our state has made it the law that we allow concealed firearms in our campus, we must have a plan. We must attempt to limit the chaos. We must try to save as many lives as possible. It is our responsibility. It is up to us. Thank you so much for your time. It is a privilege to address the board. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that story. And Isabel, thank you for being proactive. Uh, and we have um, asked Dr. Serata to ask the, the chief and do, uh, Dr. Hiron to give us a presentation on uh, the status of, of that plan that you're talking about. And so hopefully after we um, see that presentation, we can give some more input and, and work together on, on a plan of where where the testing and the practice and the, all of that comes into play. I'll just share with you my nine-year-old daughter um, taking her school a couple weeks ago, and she happened to, out of the blue, say, is, is that going to happen in our school? Oh God. Uh, it's a reality. It's not. Uh, um, so thank you again for sharing your story. And Ms. Bell, thank you for being so proactive. Thank you so much for listening. We appreciate your time. Ms. Fierro. Yes, Dr. Graham. I think that, that this um, needs to have a timeline. That should be the first thing that we request. Because I've, I think we've had presentations. We've talked about it. I know I can look back through my minutes, but I know I brought it up probably two years ago. And we haven't moved forward with that as far as I know. Um, you know, and the systems are critical. Uh, we just had an evacuation of two schools because of a gas leak. And it's an elementary right next to a middle school. And you know, when you're moving 2,000 people, even if they're little people, you have to have a plan. And you have to have the systems in place to secure everybody's safety. And many times I've asked employees, if there was this incident happening, do you know what to do? No, they, you know, they, they have no clue. And maybe we do have a plan, but if the staff doesn't have a clue and they're the ones that are gonna be at the forefront right. of whatever, anything that may happen. You're and, absolutely right, I agree with you. Yes, and, and we've got to have a timeline as to, okay, forget another presentation. 
what the first thing we need is a timeline. When is this going to happen? When are the drills going to take place? How are we going to roll out the plan? So everybody knows about it. And if we need help from other entities, by all means, we can get it for the college, but we've got to move it forward. Thank you very much. Dr. Santa, will you work on a draft yes, timeline for our next board meeting? Yes, sir. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Thank you. As always, thank you for having us here. Uh, uh, Chair Fierro, President Zarata, members of the board. Uh, sorry. <laughs> oh, first and foremost, we would just like to say thank you for uh, supporting the food pantry. And this is just a, a, a wide thank you to every single one of you in this room for being so proactive and for reaching out to us in ways that we can expand um, our food pantry and make it more effective. Um, we're, we're really thankful for that, for all the support that we've been getting these last couple of weeks. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about, I'm, I'm nearing my last board meeting, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about my goal. Uh, when I was running for student government, I wanted to increase civic engagement and political participation among our, well, our students. Um, and I feel really proud about the, the strides that we've made in that direction of advancing civic engagement. And mo first, most importantly, uh, I wanted to make it SJA's mission to advocate for underserved and underrepresented communities um, here and within our college to be the voice of the voiceless in a sense and to help empower those communities. Uh, so today I'm here to just give you a brief, a brief um, rundown of the things that we've done. Uh, Brian and I were both uh, Voto Latino fellows this, this semester. We registered over 500 students to vote, um, both here at EPCC and at UTEP, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it, it, in El Paso numbers is really, really uh, a big impact. Um, the debates that we scheduled all through last month were really, really successful. We had a really great showing at the US uh, Congress debate. We had a lot of media presence, and it was honestly really, really exciting to get a chance to, to ask questions of the candidates and to get to talk to them a little bit. Um, another thing that we uh, participated in recently was the walkout for DACA. So they, uh, Soñando Juntos is an entity, it's an organization that started at UTEP, and it seeks to address um, the problems that the undocumented students face. They reached out to us uh, here at EPCC to have a walkout in support of a Clean Dream Act. As you know, we're, our Dreamer students are still in the limbo as far as that policy, so we just wanted to show our support and to let them know that they are cared for and that student government is here to address any issues that they might have. Another, another um, event that we had just last week we had the students forum in keeping our campuses safe. It was a conversation in coalition with the Senate, I mean with uh, Senator Jose Rodriguez, uh, the Youth Advisory Committee, El Paso Community College Student Government, UTEP Student Government, as well as high school students from different backgrounds. It was a really successful event. We had a pretty good, a pretty good showing of people, and we were able to address the issue of uh, school safety, not just in regards to school shootings, but in, in a broader sense. Uh, we also included our immigrant students. We included cyberbullying in that conversation. But the, the topic at hand, the, the, at the heart of it, was definitely um, gun reform and keeping our schools safe. We will be having a follow-up event in the anniversary of the Columbine shooting, and we would invite you. We would like to invite you all to be there to keep the conversation going and to actually do something and not just talk about something. Um, and to kind of just segue off of that, I had the pleasure to be. I was invited to the March for Our Lives, which happened last weekend. Um, I was invited to speak at the event. It was really awesome. 
Um, and it's just really moving to see so many students become involved and to stand up for, sorry, <laughs> to stand up for the things that they believe in. Um, it makes me really proud. <laughs> Um, another thing that we've done oh, <laughs> is we've time. supported, <laughs> sorry, it's just that no, the story no. was so moving. Uh, we've supported uh, an initiative that came out of Senator Jose Rodriguez's office. It's called Veterans Dress for Success with, um, with donations and setting ourselves up as a drop-off location. Basically, it, the, the, the purpose of, of the initiative is just what it sounds like. We are collecting professional clothes so we can pass out to uh, veterans in need so they're able to join the, uh, the, civi the civilian life more, more easily. Another thing is we will be having, S we are having SG elections currently, so I'm really excited to see uh, who comes after me and who we get to, who gets to bug you next year. Um, in regards to the board meetings, et cetera. Um, one thing that I do want to bring up uh, is we have had concerns on, on behalf of the, uh, the clubs and organizations at our school in regards to the travel policy, which we have in place as of right now. Um, so the six hour drive, if you're familiar with it, uh, we believe that this, this policy is very limiting of our students' experiences and is limiting it limits our students in participating in activities that support and expand their educational experiences. Uh, we would like the policy to reflect multiple drivers that can go further than six hours. Um, the, this policy as it is in place now uh, is very detrimental to our clubs as they do not have the budgets to, to secure commercial um, flights or our drivers to, to go on a bus. As you know, they work very, very hard to fundraise every single day, every single week, and they have earned every penny that they have in their accounts. And we don't want them to suffer because they want to go to a convention that is seven hours away from El Paso. We are so far away from everything, and we hope that you will reconsider this policy and, and lift those restrictions. Here with me is Paul with the automotive uh, club, he's gonna say a few words. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, I'm not up on my uh, parliamentary procedures, so please bear with me. <clears throat> a little about myself, so you can put a little weight behind what I'm gonna ask. Uh, 28 years working in the automotive field uh, between the civilian world and 20 years in the military. I just retired. Uh, I'm a full-time student, but at the same time, I'm a uh, master automotive technician full-time at BMW of El Paso. So I, I know a little bit about the automotive world. <laughs> the SEMA event, all right, the Specialty Equipment Market Association, which is the big thing that the Automotive Society goes to or tries to go to each year, is the thing that anyone who wants to be a mechanic to an automotive technician to just working at a parts counter, this is where they need to go. This is the place that shows you what's coming, how to, how to prepare for it, what you need to do, the tools you're gonna need to go and buy. Right, this is the show. It's in Las Vegas. It's 11 hours away. The current restrictions, we can't attend unless we fly. That'd be an extra $2,500 this coming year, 2019 is the next one we're planning on going to. $2,500 just for the tickets. All the math's already been done. It's $2,500 extra versus renting a van, two instructors go along, six hours apiece, we're there with a break in between. So we're just asking if you could reconsider, if not just for our club, for all the other clubs that spoke with uh, the young lady. I was supposed to have a bigger turnout today and they didn't really show up. Uh, other than that, that's what I had to present. Well, thank you for your service, first and foremost. Uh, and just to kind of close it off, uh, we will be traveling to Austin this next Wednesday for the state convention. As you know, we are the host representative on the executive board at the, at the state level. It's called the Texas Junior College Student Government Association. We're really excited about that. Um, we are flying <laughs> since it's about, what, 12 hours? Eight hours. Eight hours. 
Well, I don't know where I'm going, but <laughs> taking the long way. So uh, thank you for your time again, and thank you for taking the time to listen to our concerns. Well, thank you for your leadership, and you're leaving some big shoes of field. So thank you again for the great year. Thank you. Can I, can I make a reminder that you were going to, at some point, try and work with your group to see if you all can come up with some ideas that will help us with the recruitment efforts? Yes. Student recruitment efforts. I just don't want that to be forgotten so we can bring it back to the forefront. I know you're leaving, but. Yeah, I, I mean, we did bring it up. We did address it a couple of uh, board meetings ago, but we will talk to the recruitment office to see what we can come up with together. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> item 1.8, communications none. Item 1.9, Board of Trustees business. Item 1.9.1, the Board of Trustees will hear the appeal presentation of Ms. Nita Coral Nava. Can I, I make a comment on 1.9? 1.9, yes. I just want to make sure the Board knows that we, um, we had um, worked on that, uh, the legal request, the proposal. So we've oh, given some yes. information to Ruben, and he's going to be... Um, looking at it and trying to move it forward. But I think we've got some consensus on, on your committee. where we're going. Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Graham. Yes. Um, uh, item 1.9.1, Ms. Coral Nava, uh, the, you have the option of doing your presentation in open forum or an executive uh, session. It, it's t up to you. What would you prefer? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. W would you mind coming to the microphone? No. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. I believe I shared that it be in closed session. Okay, it's fine. Um, Pam, would you please call us into executive so we can address this item? The Board of Trustees may conduct an executive or closed session pursuant to Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code for one or more of the following reasons. Consultation with its attorney to seek or receive legal advice or consultation regarding pending or contemplated litigation or for any purpose authorized by law. Discussion about the value or transfer of real property discussion about a prospective gift or donation, consideration of specific personnel matters, discussion about security, personnel or devices, or discussion of certain economic development matters. The board may also announce that it will go into executive session on any item listed on this agenda if the subject matter is permitted for a closed session by provisions of Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code. Any vote regarding these items shall be taken in open session. The time is 7.43 p.m. The Board of Trustees are reconvened in regular session. Item 1.9.1, no action. Item 1.10, Board Reports. Item 1.10.1, Treasurer's Report, February 28, 2018, no action is necessary. Item 1.10.2, President's Report. Item 1.10.2.1, Dr. Sarata will update the Board of Trustees and audience on recent events that have transpired at the college. Chair Fierro, members of the board, I'd like to remind you that the groundbreaking for the new buildings uh, that we are building at the Valle Verde campus will be held on Wednesday, April the 11th at 10 a.m. in the breezeway between the architecture building, Building Z, and um, the A building. Uh, the El Paso Community College Diversity Program's 2018 Men's Forum 
will be held on April 19th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. in the Valle Verde Cafeteria Annex and Courtyard. Uh, I'm happy to report that the Joint Review Committee on Education and Diagnostic Medical Sonography, say that fast, reviewed and accepted uh, the DMSO program at, program's annual report in February 2018. There were no recommendations for change at this time. Congratulations to Program Coordinator Nora Valderas and Clinical Coordinator Eloy Tinajero for your dedica dedication and great work on the report. Uh, as well as thanks to Dr. Paula Mitchell for your leadership and oversight of the program. EPCC's Rise to the Challenge Bridge program was featured in the March 2018 issue of the Insight into, into Diversity Digital, Publica Digital Publication. As you remember, uh, EPCC was the recipient of the 2017 HEADS Award as one of three institutions dedicated to connecting students to their successful careers by facilitating hands-on experience both inside and outside of the, of the classroom. Uh, the RISE program was featured as a program that successfully recruits, graduates, and prepares science students through hands-on research. Dr. Karina Castillo, a former RISE student who is now full-time chemistry faculty at El Paso Community College and a research mentor of award-winning RISE students Itzel Tejada and Zaira Dorado. Congratulations to those students as well as to Dr. Maria Alvarez uh, the Rise and Build Program Director, and to Dean Rick Webb for the great recognition. The Northwest Campus Library was awarded the Library Instruction Project of the Year by the Texas State Library Association. The Teachership Academy Project Embedded Librarianship, submitted by Laura Lee Ambrise, in collaboration with Michael Duncan and the English Discipline at the Northwest Campus, won the award this year. The award will be presented at the Texas Library Association Conference in April of this year. Congratulations to Ms. Ambris, the Northwest Campus Head Librarian, Dr. Michael Duncan, our English faculty member, and the English Discipline faculty at the Northwest Campus. Special thanks and congratulations to Dr. Lydia Tena, the Northwest Campus Dean, who along with the Teachership Academy Steering Committee is celebrating their 10th anniversary this year. The Senior Adult Program hosted their 23rd annual Love Conference on February 27th here at the ASC. The event brought in 600 seniors and 45 agency exhibitors who were treated to a keynote address by Ms. Rosa Guerrero. Uh, awards were presented to EPCC faculty, including Super Senior of the Year to Ms. Uh, Ina Holder, Volunteer of the Year to Ms. Corky Rodriguez, Singer of the Year to Mr. Ryan Gonzalez. The Oldies But Goodies singing group was also presented with an award. Uh, many thanks to Ms. Mary Yanez, the Senior Adult Program Director and her staff for the great work as well as to Dr. Farias for your leadership and support of the program. On the 26th of February, the Skills USA competition took place at the Valle Verde Campus Advanced Technology Center. Approximately 140 students participated from, El, from the El Paso, Isleta, and Socorro School Districts. Several UPCC programs participated, in, including culinary arts, automotive, cosmetology, and business. Uh, thanks to Dr. Olga Valerio, the ATC Dean, for hosting the competition and positively impacting so many area high school students. Many thanks to our faculty who continue to volunteer and give of their time to serve our community and showcase our programs. Uh, Dr. Jaime Farias, thank you again for your leadership and support on this program, which is much appreciated. On February 19th, the Trans Mountain Campus hosted the 19th annual Spirit of the Star Day celebration. The annual event which commemorates the birthday of Texas um, uh, Iwo Jima Day and President's Day was sponsored by the City of El Paso Sunrise Neighborhood Association, Irvin High School Band, West Texas Young Marines, and El Paso Flags Across America. So, uh, the presentations included the reading of state proclamations from Governor Abbott, celebration ladies from First Lady Cecilia Abbott, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, and House Speaker Joe Strauss. More than 80 high school and EPCC students participated in the event. Many thanks to our faculty members, uh, Vanessa Camacho, Jerry Navarro, and Ms. Park, as well as to Ms. Jan Eveler, um, our Trans Mountain uh, Campus Dean for your work and commitment on another and successful event. And finally, Chair and members of the board, um, in your documents, uh, you have uh, the Hispanic Outlook on Education, which once again has, uh, for the 11th year in a row, has ranked El Paso Community College as the top community college in the nation <laughs> for granting the most associate degrees to Hispanic students. We are on the cover. Kudos uh, to Carrie Moe uh, and her team uh, who worked on this diligently uh, and 
to all of the faculty and staff at El Paso Community College for ensuring that we continue to be ranked first in the nation. And that concludes my report. Thank you for making the district proud again, Dr. Sorata. Item 1.11, consent docket. Item 3.2 is the only item on the consent docket. Motion to approve. Second. Any questions? Mrs. Robles. Aye. Mr. Uxer. Aye. Ms. Solis. Aye. Dr. Graham. Aye. Mr. Fierro. Aye. Item 2.0, administration, none. Item 3.1, full-time institutionally funded actions. Move to approve 3.1 and 3.3. Second. Did she say 3.3? 3.3. Oh. OK, there's no action required on oh. item 3.3. Then I second it. <laughs> Any, Any questions? questions? Okay. Mrs. Robles. Aye. Mr. Uxer. Aye. Ms. Solis. Aye. Dr. Graham. Aye. Mr. Fierro. Aye. Item 3.3, .3, information items, no action is required. Item 4.1, consideration and deliberation on the approval to purchase services and audiovisual equipment for the conversion of 26 classrooms into technology enhanced classrooms from Access Communications Group, LLC, in an amount not to exceed $348,662. Move to approve 4.1, 4 4.2, and 4.3. Second. Second. Any questions? Oh, please read them, Pam. One second. Item 4.2, consideration and deliberation on the approval to purchase services and accessories for the infrastructure and conversion of 26 classrooms into technology enhanced classrooms from AC and J Communications doing business as Metrocom in an amount not to exceed $57,370 Item 4.3, consideration and deliberation on the approval of the renewal of an annual contract for maintenance and support for software from Ad Astra Information Systems in the amount of $55,000. Questions? I just have oh, one, yes. Dr. Hironon. Um, so it's a conversion for 26 classrooms, and how many more do we have to, do we need? Any this will bring us. I'm sorry, this will bring us a total of 178 classrooms that we will have completed, but I'm going to have to defer to Ms. Nancy Gomez, who's keeping track <coughs> of how many additional classrooms oh, are left after this phase. Ms. Gomez, would, would you let us know? As Ms. Gomez comes up, these are the existing, current existing classrooms. As the board, as we move forward with the master plan, um, again, kudos to Dr. Hiron and her team, as well as to the board who's insisting that the classrooms that we have come up in the new facilities will be up to speed. Uh, so the FF and E, they will be smart classrooms. That is the intent for all of the classrooms that we're building in the 400,000 square feet. So, so these are only addressing the ones that is the goal. Are, these are the existing classrooms, and Ms. Gomez can tell us how many classrooms will be left after we convert these 26. Hello. <laughs> um, this is my first time, sorry. Um, we started off this project with about 380 classrooms needing to be converted. At this point, we are at the 178 with the approval of these classrooms, which will give us about uh, close to 290 classrooms that would still need to be converted. And, and our objective is to convert all 290? Yes, sir. We're, we're, okay, we don't have any that they're used as study halls that might not. No, these are actual classrooms. These are actual classrooms. What's our timeline to have them all completed? Um, Depends how much Dr. Young? Yeah, well, it, again, the funding is uh, allocated. Uh, the IT committee makes that decision, and okay. Ms. Rebecca Bell um, was here earlier, so the IT committee is the one identifying the classrooms that need to be converted. Okay. And um, just for your information, not all 26 classrooms have to be fully converted. Some of them already have some equipment, so some of them are partially converted. 
Do we still have a, a long ways to go? Yes, 90? we do. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Any you. other questions? No, we're ready, Pam. Mrs. Robles. Aye. Mr. Uxer. Aye. Ms. Solis. Aye. Dr. Graham. Aye. Mr. Fierro. Aye. Item 4.4, .4, consideration and deliberation on the approval of a three-year three contract for financial and compliance audit services for the fiscal years ended August 31, 2018, 2019, and 2020 in an amount not to exceed $207,000. Move to approve 4.4 and 5.1. Uh, Second. I have a question, Chair. I'm gonna let, let Pam read 5.1, please. Item 5.1. Consideration and deliberation on the approval to award a contract to Pride General Contractors LLC for construction of offices for the purchasing and contract management department at the Administrative Service Center A building in an amount not to exceed $299,657. Um, Ms. Solis? Yes, um, so I mean, just reading the actual agenda item 4.4. To me, it looked like we, you know, we're, the board is, requ uh, administration is requesting the board to approve this con a three-year contract. But if you go and look at the notes or the agenda, uh, the supporting documentation, it's actually a renewal of the contract. Uh, it's a one-time renewal of this contract. Is right, Ms. Shaughnessy? And I, I guess, is that right? Okay. Um, so, our, when the RFQ was uh, issued three years ago, it contained a, an option to renew the contract for an additional three years if we were satisfied with the service, which we are. Okay, so I'm just curious, again, syntax, why wouldn't the actual request be not to approve a contract, but to approve the renewal of the contract of, a, of this existing contract with Peña and Briones? Here you go. That's that judge coming talk out. Talk to purchasing. <laughs> I, it says we're doing one thing, and then you look at the, the background information, and it says really we're renewing a contract that we've already approved. And, and, and I apologize. I should have caught that. So it is, it is okay. a renewal of a contract. All right. So uh, with that, if the board's okay, um, may we adjust the, or clean up the language of the motion? or We can do that. Okay. Um, Ms. Uh, Robles made the motion. Do you mind if we change the motion, Ms. Robles, to uh, renew the contract? And not, not at all. Go ahead and, uh, and approve the renewal. Okay. Ms. Rex, uh, Dr. Graham? Or some, yes. Dr. Graham, second, so we're, we're set. Uh, any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Solis. Thank you. Mrs. Robles? Aye. Mr. Uxer? Aye. Ms. Solis? Aye. Dr. Graham? Aye. Mr. Fierro. Aye. Item 6.1, consideration and deliberation on the acceptance of a grant award from the Texas Workforce Commission in the amount of $21,000. Move to approve item 6.1 and 6.2. Second. Item 6.2. Consideration and deliberation on the acceptance of a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to, di to digitalize photographs and historical documents of the settlers of Colonia Juarez in the amount of $12,000. Um, I have a question. Where do we get these photographs? Oh, don't, don't, don't run, don't run. Run, run, run. Yeah. <laughs> no. Hi, I can answer that question. Um, they're going to be actually. Well, could you identify yourself? Please? Oh yes. <laughs> you don't know me. I'm like Cher. There no. you go. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm Lisa Elliott, and I'm the pr um, principal investigator on the grant. Or is that right? Okay. Um, so we're going to be. Um, they're going to be given to us by the members of the Mormon colonies. So we're going to be digitizing their memorabilia and giving a copy of it to them for them to keep, and also. Um, putting it on as a library guide, a libguide here at EPCC, 
and making it part of University of North Texas's Portals to Texas History. Oh, great. Yeah. Thank you. Would Congratulations. You? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Did you write the grant? I did, yes. Oh, wow. Well done. Thank you, Ms. Ellie. Thank Looking forward to seeing it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Pam, we're ready. Mrs. Robles. <clears throat> Mrs. Robles. Aye. Mr. Uxer. Aye. Ms. Solis. Aye. Dr. Graham. Aye. Mr. Fierro. Aye. Item 7.1 consideration and deliberation on the approval of continuing education tuition rates for revised courses. Move to approve. Second. Questions? Pam, we're ready. Mrs. Robles. Aye. Mr. Uxer. Aye. Ms. Solis. Aye. Dr. Graham. Aye. Mr. Fierro. Aye. Item 8.0, community services, none. Item 9.0, unfinished business. Pardon me? Uh, we're at item 9.0. Okay. Um, our next meeting, Pam, is scheduled for? I don't have it right now. <laughs> Hold on. I believe it is April. April the 12th, Pam. We have our facilities, facilities and finance at 430. And the next regular board meeting is scheduled for? 23rd. Correct. On a Monday? Wait, on a Monday? Yes. No, it's uh, Wednesday. On April. Tuesday, Wednesday. April 24th at 5.30 here in the boardroom. Um, right. Prior to that, at 4 p.m., we will have our Facilities and Finance Committee on April Tuesday, April 24th. With that, I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you very much. All in favor? Hi. Hi.